lot of Christians live life on this earth kind of discouraged and confused by the state of the world that we live in. When you watch the news, when you look around at people that you know, maybe the mindset of the world is confusing. Why do people think this way? Or the morals of the world, calling good evil, evil good. The politics of the world, which unfortunately our country is getting a big dose of that right now. The opinions and provocations of the media, the violence and hatred for human life, false religions, the occult, false doctrines in the church. You know, all these things are happening around us and they can be confounding. But we often forget that we are in the midst of a spiritual battle. And that's why I love passages like this. What a great reminder when we forget why things are the way they are. You see, there's only two kingdoms. There's only two kingdoms. Though we have, you know, many countries on this world, there's God's eternal kingdom over heaven and earth, his universal kingdom, and it's good and it's truthful. It will be victorious. It's expanding in this world and will soon physically arrive. And you can read all about it in Revelation. It's coming. The king is coming and his kingdom is coming with him. But there's another kingdom, Satan's temporary kingdom that is over this world. It's evil. It's deceptive instead of truthful. It's defeated already when Jesus died on the cross and rose again. It's drinking, and though he's ruling now, it's going to be shattered to pieces when Christ returns. And so it's important to keep this big perspective as we live our lives at sojourners and strangers in enemy territory as Christians. In the meantime, we need to remain aware of the reality of the battle that rages around us, that we cannot see with our eyes. But like in the Old Testament, when Elijah told his servant um, that the armies of the Lord were all around him and he, God opened his eyes and he was able to see the hills full of angels and chariots. So Peter opens our eyes, as well as Paul that we're reading this passage today, but Peter in 1 Peter 5, 8, he says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kind of suffering are being experienced by brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever. forever. Amen. Well, as we open our minds to this spiritual battle, I also want to give you a, a warning of sorts that we should not swing too far in the direction of overemphasizing the devil and his minions. So we need to have a balance. You see, some people get so involved with the unseen realm that everywhere there's a demon, you know? The demon of the burnt toast, you know? Demon of the red light, the flat tire. (laughs) Maybe people blame Satan or uh, demons for their sin. The devil made me do it. Not every difficulty we face is directly from the devil. Um, Nor should we become pridefully foolish towards Satan. You know, I, I remember sitting at a concert when I was, I think it was in high school, and a famous Christian um, 
artist and, and he was singing a song about kicking the devil in the face. And, you know, he was saying things about the devil and going all off on the devil from the stage. And I was like, something just doesn't feel right about that. In Jude 8 through 10, it says, Yet in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, rejecting authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce blasphemous judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. And so we do not approach this with a prideful, self-important heart, but rather a reliance on the Lord. The Lord rebuke you, is what we should tell the enemy. So the basics of Christian life necessitates an understanding of spiritual warfare. And without this, you may feel like you're walking around blindfolded and people are pushing you from every side and you're, you're thinking to yourself, why, why is my balance off? You know, well, of course, because you've got people pushing you around, you know, you can't see them, but they're there. And so it is with the spiritual warfare. The enemy is at work in this world. And so we do need to be prepared. In verse 10, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Strengthen yourself in the Lord. You see this word finally, it, it points to now we enter the final section of Ephesians. In light of all that Paul has written so far. We had just talked about our place in the Christian household, you know, the Christian table. But now we look at our place in the cosmos as children of God. Where are we in this organization of, of God's kingdom? Well, Paul spoke of slavery in verses 5 through 9, and that we talked about last week. We were all once slaves spiritually of the devil. But now we've been set free and placed in a position of authority, seated with Christ in the heavenlies. And so this is our place in the cosmos. We're seated with Christ. In Ephesians 1.20, Paul talked about how Jesus, um, it says that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. And so the heavenly father raised Christ from the dead and seated him as a, at his right hand, ruling and reigning with authority with the father, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And so that's where Christ is at. But then in verse 6 of chapter 2, it speaks about you. When you accept Jesus Christ, you become part of God's kingdom. You're adopted as one of his children. And notice what it says. And raised us up with him, with Christ, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And so positionally, you are seated with Jesus Christ above all authority, power, and dominion. Not that you are king, he's king, but he's got you with him. Which means all these spiritual forces are under Christ's feet. And so you can imagine Satan is mad. He wants to keep you subjected. He wants to keep you earthbound. Yet we are heavenly citizens now. Ephesus was actually a location of a lot of occultic activity. When the gospel arrived, there was a huge transformation in Ephesus with the gospel. And in Acts 19, verse 11 through 20, I just want to read to you a little bit about what happened when the gospel came into Ephesus it says, and God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that he had touched, his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Man, that's supernatural stuff. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. 
saying, I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this, but the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. At this, and this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Also, many of those who were now believers came, confessing and divulging their practices, and a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Evil spirits were cast out. Um, People turned away from their occultic practices and witchcraft and necromancy and all these things where they sought to gain power through the spiritual realm. And to some extent it works, but there was a power that came through Christ that was greater. And so now the Ephesian Christians are on the Lord's side and they need to learn to rely upon the power of God and not the power of demons. You see, the enemy is always willing to offer a little power in exchange for something. (laughs) But we're told here to be strong in the Lord. If you're going to plug into a power source, unplug from all of those things that the world has to offer and the other spiritual things have to offer, because there's a lot of spiritual stuff out there, and you need to get plugged into one person, Jesus Christ. Because we're in a supernatural, superhuman battle, you cannot take on these spiritual beings in your own strength. Check out the seven sons of Sceva. (laughs) You know, they ran away wounded and naked. Not a good idea. And so this command to be strong is in the passive voice, which means literally this, be strengthened in or be made strong in. It's this idea that you are turning to God willfully in asking him to strengthen you. It's not that you just in yourself, in your own strength, decide to stand up and go against the enemy. It's that you say, God, I am weak and I need your help. I need your strength. In 2 Timothy 2.1, you then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. You know, Paul learned that. When he had a messenger of Satan, a thorn in his flesh, and he prayed God would take it away. And what happened? God said, nope, but I'll give you my grace because my power is made perfect in weakness, (laughs) not when you're strong enough. God will meet you where you're at, and he will give you the strength when you turn to him in faith, the authority and the power to fight and stand. It comes from that relationship with the ascended Christ at the right hand of God. Now, God gave this same, uh, same sort of command to Israel before they engaged in battle with evil giants in the promised land when they were commanded to go in and, and take the land. Um, if you remember that generation that first came out of Egypt, they, they were scared and they said, man, these people are huge. And we're like grasshoppers to them. Um, And God says, trust me. And they they didn't want to. And so God said, okay, this generation will die in the desert and I'll wait for the next generation. Um, And hopefully they'll be faithful. And so God tells them in Deuteronomy 31, 32, and the Lord commissioned Joshua, the son of Nun, and said, be strong and courageous. 
For you shall bring the people of Israel into the land that I swore to give them. I will be with you. And there's the source of their power. Be strong and courageous, not because you're crazy, but because the Lord is with you. In Joshua 1.6, be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give to them. Are you ready to be strong and courageous? It begins when you say, Lord, I need you. I'm not going to go out without you. Now, David learned to strengthen himself in the Lord. He was a man after God's own heart. You know, he couldn't live life without being in relationship with God, being close to God. And so there was a time when the Amalekites raided the city where David's family was and some of the other soldiers' families were. And the Amalekites raided the city while they were away. They took captive their wives, their sons, their daughters. And if you might be wondering who the Amalekites are, they're always kind of a picture of Satan's armies. Because when Israel came out of Egypt, when they were first born as a nation, they came across the Red Sea and they were on the other side. The first thing that happened in, in as they faced another people, is the Amalekites showed up and wanted to destroy them. You see, the enemy was behind that, and and the enemy was like, I want to destroy God's people. And he used the Amalekites again and again and again, and so they were always this picture of the evil spiritual forces, which still exist today, by the way, desiring to wipe Israel off the map. But notice this in 1 Samuel 30. And David was greatly distressed because his his family had been taken. For the people spoke of stoning him because their families were taken, because all the people were bitter in soul, each for his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. You know, he could have sat around saying, man, I messed up. This is all my fault. He could have, with a spirit of revenge, decided to strengthen himself. But no, he strengthened himself in the Lord. And then in the strength that God gave David in this low point, he was able to go forth, defeat the Amalekites, and free all the captives. Have you strengthened yourself in the Lord? You know, I think it begins for me each morning when I get up. For me, my strengthening time is um, when I get up in the morning. And and yeah, I get a little coffee, but that isn't where I find my strength. Maybe it helps me focus. But my strength is when I open my Bible and I sit there and read and meditate on the Word and have a time fellowshipping with Jesus. And he always is faithful to meet you when you come to him in faith and you listen to his word and you pray. And before you start your day, say, Lord, I need you. I need you to make it through this day in a way that honors you. I mean, I can make it through the day The days that I don't strengthen myself in the Lord, you know, I still go through the day and I I end up making it home and in bed and live another day. But it is very clear, my day does not go as well when I don't find my strength in the Lord. And perhaps you know exactly what I'm talking about. Or maybe it's been so long that you found your strength in the Lord, you don't remember what it's like to have that strength. Well, I want to encourage you guys. You know, God is always ready. He's always ready to start fresh. His mercies are new every morning. And, and when you turn to him and, and, and say, God, I have just done everything in my own strength and 
Some things I failed miserably, and other things, unfortunately, experienced success without you, which usually is not a good thing. (laughs) But Lord, I come to you now, and I, I ask that you would strengthen me. And I think it's really important to to take notes that before next week, when we talk about the armor of God, that this idea of strengthening yourself in the Lord comes before putting on the armor. You know, if you're a soldier and you carry a sword and a shield and heavy armor, you need to be strong. You need to be ready. You need to be trained. You need to do your sit-ups and push-ups and lift some weights and and get tone. And so we need that strength before we even go out to the battle. Be strengthened in the strength of his might. And I love how there's all these words for for strength. You know, there's a different word for be strong in the Lord as there is for strength, um, which refers to inherent power. It's like being somebody with big muscles. You, you might look at somebody with big muscles and say, yeah, that person's strong. That's, th- that's what this word strength means. But the word might is when that person who is strong with huge muscles goes and picks up in deadlifts, you know. I don't even know how much is a lot for deadlifting. What is a lot, Matt? 300 pounds. Yeah. Uh, Matt does that. (laughs) It's the exercise of strength. So one is having the strength inherently, and the other is to exercise the strength. And so when we pray, we call upon God who has this infinite reserve of strength. And so when we pray for his strength, actually what you're doing is you're making yourself available. God, I, I, wanna, I wanna be in a place where I need your strength. And then we ask for his might, that he would exercise his strength through you. Actually using his strength to get something done, to do something powerful. And so we rely upon his strength by stepping out in faith. If you don't step out in faith, you're not trusting in his strength. You know, you're living in a comfortable place where you're not challenged. You don't have to have courage. But when you step out in faith and trust the Lord, he meets you with his might and fills you with that power. Apart from him, we could do nothing. And so approaching the spiritual battle, we need to plug in. We need to have faith. We need to act on that faith. And so what are you plugged into for power? The Ephesians, they used to plug themselves into the occults. But how about you? You know, some people try to plug into enthusiasm. If I just... Be enthusiastic enough, you know? Or some people plug into coffee. Some people plug into crowds, you know, crowds really get them excited. Or certain kinds of music or physical strength or maybe your personal determination or education, you know, we we can choose to plug into those things or we can plug into the Lord. Those things, some of them are good. Some of them are blessings from the Lord, especially worship music, you know, we find strength there. But in James 4, 6 through 10, it says, but he gives more grace. I don't know about you guys, but every day I need some more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. 
Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. And so if you've been plugging into the wrong thing, you've been maybe even straying from finding strength in the Lord, it's time to come back and draw near. And he'll meet you there. And then start resisting the devil instead of going along with his plans. And that leads us to verse 11. To stand against the scheme of the devil. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Start each day realizing that we're being deployed in enemy territory. In 2 Timothy 2, 3 through 4, it says, Share suffering as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. When we wake up in the morning, we start our day and realize we're on this earth, aliens and strangers, we're living in enemy territory. Then the reality check should be, then why would I want to get involved in civilian pursuits? My life is set apart for a purpose. Um, and so there are a lot of ways that we can get entangled in this world to the point that we lose focus. Instead, we're to enter enemy territory being dressed for the battle. And so we put on, which means to clothe. We clothe ourselves with the armor of God. The whole armor. It's this Greek word where we get our word penanoply from, which refers to this. Every weapon in every piece of armor that together makes up the complete equipment of a soldier. As we will learn next week, this armor of God includes both offensive weapons and defensive weapons. No doubt when the Ephesians heard this in their mind were the Roman soldiers who they would have seen many times in their life walking through town with their helmet and breastplate and shields and swords and all these things, special shoes. When we're talking about offensive weapons, we'll learn the Bible is the sword of the Spirit. We'll learn communications with your commander and support is through prayer. But we'll also look at all the pieces of the armor, which are defensive. But none of the armor pieces cover the back. None of them cover the back. We're, we're supposed to face the battle, not run away. If we run away... We're going to get stabbed or shot in the back. But if we're facing the enemy head on, then guess what? We've got shields, we've got breastplates and helmets and all these things to protect us. And that's why it says here, stand. Take your stand. To face opposition and resist with courage is this idea of standing. It's a posture in this life that you are standing against the schemes of the devil. You see, our victory is already won in Jesus Christ, which this is really cool. Our victory is already won in Christ. And so when we stand in the battle, we stand in the victory and authority of Jesus. You're standing as the winning side. I played soccer from the time I was little, until the time I was in high school, and then I played a little bit after high school. Um, but I remember a time when we were on the, this premier team, and after a game that we had won, um, it was hot, and it was summer, and it was this tournament. Everybody's emotions were kind of rough, 
because of how the game went. And the losing team decided to pick a fight as we were shaking each other's hand, you know. And I still remember, you know, the, the people um, that had always walked through the line turned around and they rushed the other team. And even our coach that was, was this young guy, he jumped into the fight. And there were a couple of us that were like, this is crazy. <laughs> One, come on. We don't need to fight the enemy like this, you know. So when we stand, realize you are on the winning team. You are on the winning team. And it says in Romans 8, 37, know in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We are more than conquerors. There is no reason to run. Do not retreat or surrender in fear or weakness. Do not fall at the moment of opposition. Do not rush with the crowd into some foolish pursuit. Understand there's no truce with the enemy, and so stand. And we need to be standing, and we need to be ready, because the enemy has what we call schemes. You know, it always makes you think of the evil guy. Ah, ah, ah. He's got schemes. And this idea of scheming is a systematic method of cunning, deception, strategically executed. And Satan's schemes, and he's not like Wiley Coyote, who's kind of foolish and gets stuck in his own traps all the time. As Kent Hughes says, he has been honing his methods for millennia. His emissaries visited the church councils at Nicaea and Chalcedon. He sat in on medieval faculty meetings. He is an accomplished philosopher, theologian, and psychologist. He has a thousand years of study, or a thousand years to study. You know, it's not some foolish being that we're in a battle with. The strategy, though, of the devil is revealed to us in Scripture. Though he might be wise and cunning, he isn't very creative in terms of coming up with new ideas. We know that he's called the father of lies and that he loves to start false doctrine, that he's able to do counterfeit miracles, and so we got to be ready and aware. In 2 Corinthians 11, 3 through 4, it says this, when the Corinthians were being deceived by false doctrine that was coming from the enemy, Paul said, but I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For as someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaim, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. And so Paul lays out, this is the, the enemy's schemes. With all the false religions out there, especially the Christian cults, is you'll notice they preach another Jesus. They offer a different spirit. And preach a different gospel. Those three things you can always point out in every false religion and false doctrine. But another scheme that he uses is in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. And so if you were to run into Satan... We oftentimes have that picture of the guy with the horns and the pitchfork and the tail with a little point on the end. Uh, that is not what Satan would look like. Um, we're told in Scripture, he would look like an angel of light, a beautiful temptation. We learn in Scripture that the enemy manipulates and controls world powers, that he is always out to disrupt the church with division. In your life, 
to make you prideful, doubtful, discouraged, self-focused, and addicted to sensuality. And so all his schemes, all that he tries to do to you and to God's church will come to nothing when we stand in the strength and the power that God provides. So there's no reason to be intimidated or afraid of the enemy. And so as we're talking about spiritual warfare, maybe you're, you're getting a little scared, you know? You're thinking about shadows that you see at night or maybe you've actually had some spiritual experiences that were not the Lord. Understand that Jesus Christ provides the power and the authority to overcome the enemy. But Satan, though he schemes and though he's powerful, he's not all-powerful. He's a created being. A lot of people have in their minds what we call dualism, that there's good and there's bad and they're equal and they're always fighting back and forth. That is unscriptural. It's not the, it's not the way things are. We don't see a cosmic dualism when it comes to Satan and God. Satan is not infinite. He's not all-powerful. He's not omnipresent, nor is he all-knowing. But, I mean, he has minions that do his bidding all over the place, so maybe you feel like he's omnipresent, but he's not. Satan is a created being and is nothing compared to God. He's like a speck of dust in the universe compared to God. He was defeated by Christ on the cross and through his resurrection. And so when we come against the enemy's schemes, in 2 Corinthians 10, we're, we're given a picture of how we engage in this battle. It says, For the weapons of our warfare are not of flesh, but have divine power to demolish strongholds. We destroy arguments in every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. And take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. So notice how much our battle has to do with the truth. Destroying arguments raised up against the knowledge of God. Taking every thought captive to Christ. And so we see this picture that Paul gives in this spiritual warfare. And in Garland's commentary on 2 Corinthians, it says this about the verses we just read. Paul appeals to the three stages of the campaign in ancient siege warfare. There's three principles here. Destroying defensive fortifications, taking captives, and punishing resistance when the city is finally brought to submission. And so when you read those verses, you see that that we take out the strongholds and then we move over the fortifications and into the city and we take captive every thought to Jesus Christ. And so there's this battle going on all the time in our minds with regards to the truth and the things people say in this world. And so you got to be on your guard and you, you need to be familiar with scripture because the enemy is a master deceiver. So take your stand. And it, when you don't know the answer to something, that's okay. Don't run away. <laughs> you can say, I don't know the answer to that, but I know that's not right. Um, I'm going to find it out. I'll talk to my life group leader, I'll talk to the youth pastor, I'll talk to the pastor or Grant, the worship leader, or an elder. I'll I'll find the answer out somehow, but just because I don't know it doesn't mean I don't know it's being presented to me as false. Fight the battle. Stand, no matter what comes your way. And then lastly, we daily wrestle against spiritual forces of evil. And this is where... We wrap this up in verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood 
but against the rulers and against the authorities and against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And so here comes this word, wrestle. I grew up where my brother and I wrestled all the time. That's the little brother. So usually it ended up with me on the ground with his knees on my shoulders and, uh, you know, him doing whatever he wanted to, to me, which usually consisted of, you know, tapping on my chest or d- dropping, you know, spit and then sucking it up. <laughs> Ooh, almost got gotcha. you. I almost got gotcha. you. He got me one time and he didn't mean to, but... And you know, when you wrestle, it's like intense and it's personal and it's exhausting and you're done and you're like, oh man, the whole world's like fuzzy because you've used all your energy. How many of you guys wrestled growing up with your siblings or your friends? Okay. If you haven't, you know, you're missing out. <laughs> you're really missing out. But this word means to grapple. Hand-to-hand combat. It's the act of engaging in close hand-to-hand combat. The, the battle that we face is not like shooting missiles or arrows from a distance. This is a personal hand-to-hand combat. Zodiati says it was used of the wrestling of athletes and the, of the hand-to-hand combat of soldiers both of which required deftness and speed. It denoted the struggle between individual combatants in distinction from an entire military campaign. So though there is a full army, this is you and the enemy face to face, hand to hand. When we enter a spiritual battle, it's personal. We're locked in a struggle and we're dripping sweat and blood along with our enemy. But notice what it says. We do not fight against flesh and blood. And so that's an idiom that's used to speak of the weakness of mankind, his mortality. We're not fighting against mere human beings. Our struggle is not against man. Our struggle is supernatural. Our struggle is against spiritual forces. And so Paul speaks of all these spiritual forces with a bunch of different titles. Rulers, authority, cosmic powers. And that sounds intense. We're talking about big, scary, fallen angels that at this point have control on this earth and interact with even human governments Um, there are high-ranking fallen angels like in Daniel where it says this in Daniel 10, 12. Then he said to me, fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before God, your words have been heard and I have come because of your words. Daniel prayed and God sent a messenger The prince of Persia, or the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. So in the spiritual realm, there's this fallen angelic being called the prince of Persia. But Michael, one of the chief princes, the archangel, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia. And so a spiritual battle raged that Daniel knew nothing about as he waited for 21 days for an answer to prayer. We don't always know what's going on. And these are all the different kinds of spiritual beings. You know, we're we're not sure if the list here is a hierarchy or if it's just a bunch of different names for spiritual beings. But the point is, they are organized. There is a hierarchy. And their commander, Satan himself. So we're given a glimpse into the spiritual forces of evil 
over this present darkness. And so by associating yourself with Jesus Christ, there is by definition a spiritual army organized in ranks under the headship of Satan that is in opposition to you. Where are they? Well, they're in the heavenly places. This is speaking of that which is above the earth, but not the highest heavens where God is. It's the celestial fear, sphere, sorry. Heavenly places relating to or inhabiting heaven here, the lower heavens, the sky or air as the seat of evil spirits, the dwelling place of evil spirits. We learned in Ephesians 2, 2, that Satan is called the prince of the power of the air. You know, and so take that as you will in your understanding of what we see happening in this world today with crazy lights in the skies and things people can't explain with science that doesn't follow the normal rules of physics and all this stuff. But we're not going to get into all that because that's not what matters. Again, that could be a distraction. What we're called to do is in the hand-to-hand combat, understand that we're fighting against spiritual forces and not against our neighbors. We're not fighting against the opposing political party. We're not fighting against that person who has falsely accused you. Understand that there are spiritual forces behind the visible world influencing governments, influencing people that haven't met Jesus Christ. And remember, though, that we are seated above the heavenly places In Colossians 2.15, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So when you face that battle, Jesus has already conquered these spiritual forces, but we got to recognize when it happens. And so I love when Jesus is dying on the cross and the people are casting lots for his clothing, he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Stephen, when he's facing martyrdom, and they're stoning him to death, and he sees a vision of God in heaven. He says before he dies, Father, forgive them. In the same manner, in the same heart as Christ, and so as you look around today, and you may have been so angry with somebody, or so upset, with a political leader or whatever it is, understand it's not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces. And so what do we pray for, for those people? Well, we, we, we pray that they're saved, that they're freed from the enemy and stop being used by the enemy as a proxy. Well, I want to end with this after we're going to apply. Um, Number one, suit up. You're a soldier of Christ in a spiritual battle. And so this morning, that's the reminder. We got to start each day by suiting up. Find your strength in the Lord and, and don't get caught up in spiritual or uh, civilian affairs. <laughs> Be about the kingdom of heaven. Secondly, strengthen yourself in the Lord. Plug your power and your power cord, if you will, into Jesus Christ. And so what might that look like for you? Maybe it is morning time. You wake up and you spend time with the Lord. Or maybe it's when you're facing that meeting at work. And you pray beforehand, Lord, give me strength. Or when you're watching the news and you're discouraged... And you pray, Lord, give me your perspective. 
I ask for hope, and I, I pray that you would keep my eyes on your coming kingdom. Strengthen yourself in the Lord. And lastly, your battle's not against flesh and blood, so pray for the lost and share the gospel of light. How cool would it be if your greatest enemy on this earth met Jesus and got saved? That would be powerful. And so pray for our leaders. Pray for your neighbors. Pray for your worst enemy because they're being used by the enemy and they don't even know it. By God's grace, you were saved. (laughs) By God's grace, let's pray God would save them. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and for this perspective that we're in a battle. And so God, even now we turn to you and pray that you would be the one to keep our focus right, keep our eyes fixed on you, and that you might strengthen us where we're at. And maybe we feel weak, like we can't forgive somebody, we can't deal with whatever's going on in this world. In our weakness, you are strong. And so we ask you to fill us up, to strengthen us in this dark day. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.